Hi, everyone. I'm Mark Turner, president of the Gilroy Chamber of Commerce, and we are completing our eighth annual legislative summit today with Senator John Laird, who is the uh, senator over the 17th Senate District in California. Uh, the senator has quite a resume, but just a few of the things I wanted to make mention of that he is a former mayor, a former cabinet secretary uh, under Governor Brown, and he is also a former college, uh, community college trustee. Senator Laird, thank you for being with us today. It's my pleasure. Well, Senator, we'll go ahead and just jump right in. I know that we want to get down to some of the topics that we have uh, agreed to talk about, one of them being COVID. Uh, it has been a long uh, 15 or 16 months. Uh, Governor Newsom, of course, has indicated that he will keep the statewide emergency declaration in place. And there appears to be no end to sight on that in sight. And so is there a point in which the state legislature might need to step in and pass a concurrent resolution ending the emergency declaration uh, before, before he does? Uh, it's possible, but I think we'll just, this whole thing has been taking it as it unfolds. And, you know, I got sworn in just a few days over six months ago, and it was crazy. It's, I couldn't have friends or family. We only had 33 of the 40 senators on the floor. We, the chaplain couldn't even come in. I gave the prepared prayer for the chaplain. Uh, they told us, please don't congregate together, not realizing what we do occupationally. And that was a very hard thing to do. And until last week, we were tested twice a week. We were tested every uh, day before a floor session. And if we didn't pass the test, we weren't allowed on the floor session. And this is just a microcosm of what's been going on in the entire state. And I found myself chair of the education budget subcommittee, half the budget. And in my second week of our full session, I'm at the table negotiating school reopenings. And exactly to your question, at the time, things were surging out of the holidays it, it, uh, cases. It was a question of whether to try to force schools to reopen. And over the month that, that we talked about this and got to final action, the pandemic shifted and it was really us spending billions of dollars to help schools reopen because it was clear everybody wanted to reopen when the pandemic changed slightly. And so that's been the thing all the way along is to follow where the public health is. And right now we're just on the edge. I mean, we're reopen, it's good. Uh, uh, we just have to know that there isn't a surge of cases and, and cases are up in a few counties where people have low vaccination rates. And we just have to ride this out a little while longer. Uh, obviously, if that, emergency declaration isn't lifted after we ride this out a little longer. We will ask for that to happen, but th that's the uh, situation. Okay, well, thank you for that. You certainly know that during this long period of time that COVID has certainly impacted so many other parts of our lives and our state and all that's going on. One of those areas in particular is, is homeless. Uh, and with regard to the homeless issue, we know we have some real challenges, especially here in Gilroy. But what we have learned recently through a state audit is that there's been some challenges in the way these agencies provide these continuums of care and that there's been a lack of communication and quite frankly, a, a, a waste of a lot of money at the state level. Uh, can you tell me why do you think that has been allowed to go on the way it has? Well, he, 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 I don't think there's a waste the, the, the way that is, but the problem is, is even at the local level, it's about how you allocate it. Uh, uh, the state really budgeted the year before I got there for impact. And then I know in two of the four counties of my district, they took the money and they gave a little to every agency that was dealing with homeless issues. And, and the real issue is uh, along the Central Coast and Southern Santa Clara County is interesting. It's, it, it, you know, Santa Cruz, which is my home and, and part of the district and San Luis Obispo, which is at the Southern part of the district, the average per capita homeless against the population is greater 
than many of the urban areas of Oakland or San Francisco or San Diego or Los Angeles. And yet the money is really guided to the urban areas, even though it's disproportionate and it's overwhelming the local governments in those areas. And I know there was an encampment in Gilroy uh, along a Caltrans uh, right of way. And so the real question is, is can we target it? it and can it go for that impact? Can we really, on an emergency basis, house people? And there's a larger question that we may talk about is what in our housing market or what in our economy or what in sort of dual diagnoses of other issues has led to the big homeless population that, that leads us to have to figure out how to lower it and, and try to guide it to, to housing and, and, and some wraparound services for those that really need them. But the, the real thing is, is making sure that the money goes to house people and the money goes to house people for impact because th there have been three places, Gilroy is one, San Luis Obispo is one, and Santa Cruz is a third where there've been major evictions from Caltrans right of ways because of campgrounds. And in many ways, it's just relocating people. They're just camping somewhere else. It's not getting them into housing or getting them into services. And, and that's sort of the corner we have to turn. And I think this year in the budget, we want to use some of the one-time money precisely for that purpose. And I sit on the Joint Audit Committee, which does audits and aims at some of these problems as to why it wasn't spent in the right way or what is the best way for impact. And, and I'm looking out exactly for that because it makes no purpose to appropriate the money if it doesn't go for what you're trying to do and it doesn't actually meet the need. Exactly. And that's actually leads into my next question. And that is, what, what is it that the legislature will do in order to address this problem going forward so that these agencies are communicating better, that there is more, uh, I, I guess, maybe more targeted, successful effort in the way that money is being used? I think we actually have to target it. We actually have to set some goals. It's like, how many people are you going to house for the money you get? And and target it on that. And yes, there's mental health services and there's food services and there's health services and there's other things around it. I mean, there's one particular program that I happen to be going to tomorrow in Santa, as we take this in Santa Cruz, which is all encompassing. Uh, uh, they have a loft for overnight uh, uh, staying. They have a clinic. They have a place where people that are homeless that come out of the hospital can rehab until they're on their own. They have a locked ward. They have a family shelter for families. Um, th th they have showers, they have mailboxes, and it's a way uh, to, tr and their primary goal, their predicate for participating in the program is you have to be willing to look for housing and accept the placement if you work with people to find it. And that's the goal triage people along in every conceivable way and get them into housing. And now they're even proposing a 120 unit building on their campus that is small single room occupancy apartments for low income people. And I think that's part of the solution is really providing housing. And, and that is what we really uh, have to do. And that sounds like a great plan. What about from, from an accountability standpoint or, or through this plan and through these targeted efforts, what types of measurables would you be looking for in order to make sure that, that success is occurring and that the, uh, the right things are being done? And you know, that is exactly the right question. And, and, and for example, in the news the last few days, there's been an issue about whether or not the state's been doing as much fire prevention on certain lands as was represented they were doing. Well, I just happen to have a bill that, that tries to do a five-year fine for fire prevention, but a key part of the bill is the accountability, that every year we actually document how many acres were treated, how many acres of either forest or uh, 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 or prevention and fire safe councils. If there's prescribed fire controlled burns, how many acres were done? There's this complete accountability measure so that you can't duck uh, uh, what you're spending for and making sure it's accountable and you can adaptively manage. If it turns out some things are working or some other, or, or you're really not doing it, you need to shift the money. It gives you a chance to do that. We need to do the same thing with homelessness in a way that how do we know exactly how many 
people are housed, for how long, what are the biggest things that are the impediments that need to be matched with it. Uh, you know, in San Luis Obispo at the homeless shelter, uh, they, it turns out one of the biggest impediments was people were being separated from their pets. And so they would not come into any housing if they were being separated from their pets. So now they have a kennel and a shelter at the shelter and volunteer veterinarians from the community come in and it has brought all these people in that, that weren't in before. So how do you make sure that you document, you're, you're accountable exactly as you're asking, and you identify what the things are that keep people from accessing housing and services. Interesting too, as you said, and just having the ability to house their pets was really a simple little fix to getting more people to, to join in in the effort and, and to participate in the housing that was available. Uh, yeah, those are the things you learn, right? When you have the conversations and, and really find out what the need is. As we, as we talk more about housing, let's move into that. I think we, we all say, okay, so really, what's the answer to the problem? We know that we need more housing, more affordable housing, more, more housing in general. Gosh, what is the answer to that problem? Well, there is no single answer. <laughs> yeah. and, and the That's thing about answer. it is, is it took us 30 or 40 years to get into this mess. Right. And, and so it's good. You know, the federal government walked away from helping in housing in the 1980s. And that is noticeably different. I mean, it, it, my service as a mayor and a city council member so long ago that I was on the Santa Cruz City Council when the earthquake happened. And we lost, our downtown was closed for two or three years. We lost single room occupancy places. And in one that we rebuilt in the downtown, uh, initially they proposed 20% of it to be affordable. And by the time it was built, if 45% was affordable and the plans are approved by the city council. But there were streams of federal money that came in behind and allowed the developer to build enough and make it affordable. And, and when that happened, uh, uh, it, it, it just provided an, an excessive amount of affordable housing. That doesn't exist. And, and in the Silicon Valley, when there were all the jobs created and no housing with it, it created an unequal housing balance. And for the longest time, it was Southern Santa Clara County that was the one place that there was affordable housing. It still is. My niece just bought a house in Gilroy, a uh, first time home buyer. She will be uh, uh, living there. I think they took possession this last weekend. And yet she had to stretch uh, uh, to do it. And it, it really is providing more housing, providing more affordable housing, uh, accepting the fact that we're probably overall past being able to do single family housing on a large scale. And it's really gonna be group, uh, group apartments, condos, uh, um, you know, multi-unit things in urban areas because it has to be where the existing urban footprint is in many places, or, or you'll be like Southern Santa Clara County, you'll be eating up all the ag land if you don't figure out how uh, to do it. And when you need to make part of it affordable, that's not free. And so it really is state bonds for affordability, density bonuses so that you can have a slightly higher density in exchange for a percentage being affordable, uh, inclusionary housing. So it's you, you have some affordability in every uh, a group of eight or 10 houses that is built. That's what we have to do, because right now there's one school of thought that we just build extra housing and over time the price comes down. Well, there's a supposed three million unit deficit across the entire state of California. And the most that has been built in a single year in recent years is 250,000. So if we really think we're going to build our way out of this, even if that was possible, it would take 15 or 20 or 25 years. And the affordability crisis is now. And so what we have to do is figure out how to do that. And some of the the affordability as we move along in the, the, some of the proposals in the state legislature override local land use and override local zoning. Well, as a former city official, that to me has to be a last resort. And it, it, and it certainly makes no sense to do if none of the units are affordable. And there's even some places where a city might have 
10% or 15% inclusionary housing, which means affordable in a, in a project of 10 or more units. And then the state mandates 10 or 15% and overrides local land use. And then there's no gain. You do the exact same affordability as you did and, and the locals just lose some land use control. That's not right. And so I gave a speech on the floor in the first one of these because Scott Weiner has very controversial overriding local land use bills. And the one that just passed off the Senate floor a couple of weeks ago made it voluntary. So if a city wishes to participate, they can do it voluntarily. It doesn't override their land use. And it allowed me to stand up and give the speech that if we even remotely consider anything like that on a mandatory way, there has to be affordable housing in it. That it makes no sense to sort of override local zoning to build market rate uh, housing because market rate housing is not where the problem is right now. Mm -hmm. And so, there are those debates and those splits. And it's interesting because urban Southern California, uh, the Democratic representatives don't like the overriding land use because they view their neighborhoods as being gentrified and that lower income people or middle income people will be moved out for this new housing that does not provide a measure of affordability. And that's one of the reasons it's so hard. Uh, when I was in the assembly, in 2006, Governor Schwarzenegger did a large bond, series of bond measures. And as budget chair with the speaker, we said, you cannot do those bond measures unless you have a bond measure for affordable housing. And they didn't want to do it. And it's like, well, then you're not getting your other bond. So in the end, the bond measure was included for affordable housing and 50,000 units, which is a drop in the bucket, were built across the state because of that bond. And it just needs to be part of the solution. Yeah, and I like hearing you talk about uh, the concern for local control because no one knows the community like local elected officials, local residents, and they and they should have control over their destiny. So, and, and there's the housing the housing issue in particular is certainly it's much like homelessness. It's such a complex, difficult issue to address. But when the state does provide you know guidance and direction, one of the questions I had for you was with you know with the billions of dollars that that are being used and various forms and maybe in the area of the homeless uh, air, um, pr problems and challenges. Is it possible and would the legislature ever consider uh, providing financial incentives to local communities, maybe in the way of, hey, if you're going to build not just aff affordable housing, but if you're going to do more in the area of low income housing, then the incentive is that uh, the state would provide money for infrastructure projects, for uh, public safety, for adding more police officers, whatever those things might be. Because I know that it, I, I think various communities tend to kind of push back on not taking on more and more of the low income housing um, projects, if you will. But with some incentives, there could be, there could be communities saying, yes, we're more than willing to do that and, to, and do our share, right? I mean, there's, that's always the challenge is every community doing their share. Well, you're walking right into the redevelopment issue. And when the state did away from redevelopment, they did away with some of the very incentives that probably uh, uh, really helped. And yes, I worked for Jerry Brown and he was mayor of Oakland. And one of the most notorious places on redevelopment was Oakland. And that's why he felt like, okay, we need to stand up against that. But one of the most ready funding streams for affordable housing and infrastructure was redevelopment. And Jim Bell, a senator who just from Santa Clara, who just term limited out last year, kept proposing a modified return of redevelopment to do housing and some of the infrastructure that's associated with it. I would support that if, if we could figure out how to do that, because th that would be uh, uh, an important way to, to start to march back and do that. And it's, you know, I happen to have been on a redevelopment agency board for nine years. And we were the reason, we were the textbook case. I mean, our downtown was destroyed. We lost 60% of the square footage in our core downtown. If there was ever a case for redevelopment, that was it. It shouldn't have gone away. But with that then, is it, is it uh, if, if there was a collaborated effort between local elected officials and state level officials, uh, would that have a better chance of succeeding at the state level? And how, what would that look like in your mind? Well, it would, uh, uh, but it's, it's one of those things that it's a combination of figuring out 
how to finance it and come up with the money at the state level and get the commitments for what you do with the money coming from the local level. And I have 21 cities in the Senate district and except for San Jose, a portion of it, which is in the district at the far North end, the next largest city is Santa Cruz with 60,000 and it goes down. So I had coffee during the campaign with 21 mayors. I had the endorsement of 19 and they all hated the override of uh, uh, local control and they all wanted assistance from Sacramento. And I, I said to many of them, you know, the best argument against the state getting in the middle of the uh, taking away local control is to build affordable housing. And so there is that partnership. If they can figure out what they need, I mean, in Monterey, they need water. In Santa Cruz, they need land. Um, in Gilroy and Morgan Hill, they could use some infrastructure. So there are different things in every place that would help really make it possible. And that there is, you know, we were addressing in this budget that we will approve on Monday and we'll see what the governor, the negotiations are going on and, and a budget bill will emerge uh, the day after we're taping this. It'll probably be out by the time people see this. And there were some really big things. There was homelessness, there was housing for in relation to schools. There was coming back with the schools in different places. There's trying to deal with child care. There's trying to reform student aid to bring hundreds of thousands of people into student aid. There were bunches of different things to budget for impact. And with housing, there is one $4 billion allocation that helps with student housing all across the state, which actually in some communities overwhelms the housing market. So it is a de facto uh, a housing program. And some of the colleges can't figure out uh, how to do any measure of affordability. And now the state could help with that piece. And community colleges do not find housing in their mission but this $4 billion would be allowable if, if Gavilan or any other community college had any desire about building housing in conjunction with their campus. Because when I was a community college trustee and I left 18 years ago to go in the assembly, I never heard about homelessness. I never heard about people having food insecurity. And now they're estimating at some of the community colleges on the coast, three to 5% of the student body is homeless. A lot more have challenges with food. And that's one of the reasons we were trying to revise student aid, but it's another reason that we wanna offer colleges um, money for housing if they have land or other ways that they wanna do it and try to meet that need. Well, I, you, I'd love to have this conversation much, much longer. We're running short on time, and I don't want to keep you from uh, your next appointment. I do have a couple of last few questions, if if you're available. That's we great. Let's mention water. And of course, California seems to be running out of that this year. We have drought concerns. How is the state approaching this year's drought concerns? Well, it's interesting because I was involved in the drought working for Jerry Brown, and it was one of those things that <clears throat> excuse me, we, we often said you could do a few things around the margins to provide water, but the real issue was the bully pulpit. It was if every individual person in California conserved, we could get through it. And the trouble is, is we never know how long these are going to go. Is this going to be the peak year and then next year is going to be a really wet season? Or is this going to go for two or three or four years and we need to sort of parcel out what we have in a limited way to try to get through this? And, you know, Australia in the last decade had a nine year drought. God help us if we have uh, uh, something that's that long. And, and then there's certain things we were talking off mic beforehand. Uh, um, Anderson Dam over Morgan Hill. It has a real major seismic project, which is important. It needs to be seismically sound, but it had to drain a lot of the water to be able to, to uh, be safe while the project went on and before the seismic. And right at a time of a drought, it can't fill up. And so there, there are just certain issues that need to be dealt with in this. Well, and my final question, of course, as you mentioned, Anderson Dam, I understand that uh... Assemblymember Rebus's bill was on the Senate floor, at least, or you you made some motion. Tell me about that. You did something to get that. Yes. He, he, what it is, is if you go by traditional law, uh, you have to take the lowest bidder. But the federal 
Energy Regulatory Commission committee that works on dams offered a different way of doing it that would expedite the process and still protect an even thing. And so uh, Assemblyman Rivas has a bill to substitute that for the Anderson Dam project. And as we take this this morning, I floor managed it on the Senate floor and got it out 39 to zero. And we're trying to get it to the governor so he can sign this so that we can shorten the amount of time this project will take so that we can get it back online and right in the middle of a drought. I mean, it's going to take a few years, but at least it might be a year sooner. And let's do that so we can fill that dam back up and, and have more water for people that rely on the Santa Clara Water District. Yeah, anything that would expedite that would be great. Senator, thank you for your time today. I certainly appreciate the opportunity to have you with us and be a part of our legislative summit. And I certainly look forward to working with you as we go forward. It was my pleasure. And obviously, we barely got to where we needed to go. So I'll look forward to the next one and the next one and working with you uh, going forward. Outstanding. Thank you so much. That does it for now. I'm Mark Turner, President of the Gilroy Chamber of Commerce. Thank you.